Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to today's session of the APDR National Virtual Noon Conference Series. My name is Dr. Sophia O'Brien, and I'm honored to be your moderator today. We have two amazing speakers, and it's going to be a really great session. A few housekeeping items before we get started. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the APDR YouTube channel within about a week. The questions and comments are also being recorded. All attendee microphones will be muted to ensure optimal quality for the participants. If you have any questions for the speakers, please use the Q&A tool in Zoom. If there's time at the end of each talk, we'll try to have the speakers answer some questions live. Otherwise, we'll send the questions to the presenters and they can email you their response. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Our first speaker is Dr. Michael D. Fishman, Assistant Professor of Radiology and Section Chief of Breast Imaging at Boston University Medical Center. Dr. Fishman will be talking about the pregnant and lactating breast. Our second speaker is Dr. Monica Sheff, Clinical Associate Professor of Radiology and Section Chief of Breast Imaging at NYU Winthrop Hospital. Dr. Sheff will be talking about the nuts and bolts of breast calcifications. I'd like to thank Drs. Fishman and Sheff for their dedication towards this program and towards resident education. We really appreciate it. And now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Fishman. I'll stop sharing my screen and ask Dr. Fishman to share his. Great. Uh, thank you so much for that uh, warm introduction. Uh, it's really uh, a pleasure and an honor to be with everyone today. Um, and I'm going to try to move as quickly as possible, given the time, um, and do apologize, do apologize if I run a few minutes over. So um, we're just going to talk today about um, imaging of the pregnant and lactating patient. Um, most importantly, we want to understand some physiologic changes in the breast during this time, review recent uh, appropriateness criteria updates, and describe um, imaging protocols for these women in the screening and diagnostic settings, and then um, go through a number of cases to review imaging findings and management of common diseases seen during pregnancy and lactation. So um, before we even think about uh, imaging, we need to think about psychology. Um, and I, I like talking about psychology in other respects um, in our clinical care and, and workplaces. But um, you know, certainly when we're talking about women who are pregnant, um, ionizing radiation is a, is a concern. And so radiologists should be aware and able to discuss radiation safety. Um, and generally, mammography is, is safe during pregnancy and lactation, and I think that's a common misconception um, that was clarified during uh, the most recent uh, appropriateness criteria. So, um, you know, it certainly concerns from patients as well as providers, um, and so we want to be, um, we, we really want to come across and have a, a consistent message that it is safe during pregnancy. Um, Lots of changes happening during pregnancy and lactation in the woman's body, um, and certainly uh, in their breast tissue. Um, throughout pregnancy, there's an increase in the size and number of the ducts and lobules, an increase in fluid content of the breast, um, involution of adipose tissue, and um, the lobules replace the fiber fatty tissue, which we see as increased density on the mammogram. Um, by mid-pregnancy, there's a lot of uh, vascularization, um, which sometimes can lead to benign bloody discharge. Um, by late pregnancy, that secretory change can result in yellow to whitish discharge, which is classically what we will see in these women. Then um, in the postpartum setting, um, there's different um, hormonal changes that occur, and prolactin stimulates secretory changes. Um, the asini become distended with milk, and this, again, leads to increased breast volume, firmness, nodularity, what we see is parenchymal paren density, um, and it makes it much more difficult to detect findings on imaging. Um, as a result, there's sometimes a delay in the diagnosis of pregnancy-associated breast cancer, and these women can present with more advanced disease, exhibiting larger tumors, higher likelihood of axillary nodal disease compared to non-pregnant women of the same age. Um, involution typically occurs over three months, although it can take up to 18 months for changes to resolve um, histologically. So this is just uh, a typical mammogram that you might see in a, in a woman um, related to pregnancy and lactation, sort of diffuse increased parenchymal density um, and, and breast size, which decreases the sensitivity of mammography. Um, similarly, on um, ultrasound, we see sort of diffusely hypoechoic and heterogeneous tissue um, during pregnancy, and then it can become more echogenic with prominent ducts 
and increased vascularity um, as the patient starts seeing um, lactational changes. Breast MRI, again, is very limited during pregnancy because um, the ACR has not recommended IV gadolinium for these women. So uh, first uh, multiple choice question, we're going to be uh, showing a poll in a moment. Okay, great. So it looks like um, a little over half of the people um, chose the correct answer, which is uh, A. Um, excellent. And so we're going to review the, um, we're going to start then to review the ACR appropriateness criteria. Um, for those of you, most of you hopefully will know um, that the appropriateness criteria are evidence-based guidelines for specific clinical indications. Um, every year they're reviewed um, by a multidis multidisciplinary panel of experts. Um, they review literature and other methodologies, and then they rate imaging and treatment um, procedures for specific clinical scenarios, including um, in breast health, um, which is what we're talking about today. They are given category names, things that are usually appropriate, may be appropriate or inappropriate, um, with ratings and then uh, these definitions. And then similarly, there's also radiation level designations that are made um, relative to the radiation dose um, for that study. So for breast imaging um, and lactating women, there's um, screening and diagnostic um, recommendations, and we're going to kind of go through these um, during the course of the session. So next question. So 41-year-old woman, six months postpartum, currently lactating, presents for initial screening. What imaging is the most appropriate for her? And again, DM is diagnostic mammography or digital mammography, DBT is digital breast tomosynthesis, and US is ultrasound. Great. So um, definitely some variation. Um, the correct answer is A. Uh, we'd recommend uh, starting with um, MAMO, whether or not you have tomosynthesis in your practice. So um, this is variant number one in the appropriateness criteria, screening during lactation for initial imaging. Um, you know, there's potentially an increased risk of breast cancer. Um, we, we generally, um, you know, diagnostic breast imaging is, is, uh, is the same for non-lactating women. Um, we generally recommend nursing or pumping before mammography to decrease parenchymal density and improve the sensitivity of mammography. Um, about 8% of cancers in, in patients with pregnancy-associated breast cancer are subclinical um, in one study. And um, so we're, we basically just recommend um, starting with mammography, and as you can see, there's no contraindication to mammography or tomosynthesis, as we've mentioned before. So uh, we say pump and dump for these women. Again, you can see that um, DBT or mammography screening is the most appropriate ultrasound, um, certainly no radiation, and that's um, you know, less appropriate as a screening modality. All right, so uh, take home point number one, during lactation, screening um, should be performed as in non-lactating women of similar age and risk. All right, next question. So 29-year-old BRCA1 positive, 20 weeks pregnant, presents to discuss breast cancer screening. What do you suggest? Okay, so um, definitely some variation in the uh, responses. Um, again, the answer is to start with mammography. Um, so this is variant number two, screening um, for women uh, younger than 30 who are at high risk for initial imaging. Again, screening mammography can be performed in pregnant women who are at high risk. Um, we really do not um, have much concerns about um, mammography radiation, which is um, less than three milligray. Um, and it is um, recommended for these women who are at high risk. Um, ultrasound can be used as a supplemental tool, and again, breast MRI is not recommended for women who are pregnant. So again, similar recommendations um, for variant two to variant one. All right, next question. 35-year-old woman with a history of atypia is 12 weeks pregnant and consults you about screening. What do you recommend? Good. So we're uh, starting to trend in, in that direction. So um, correct for those who answered A, um, this is variant three. So uh, breast cancer screening during pregnancy for women ages 30 to 39 who are at an elevated risk 
Um, again, we didn't kind of go into what atypia it was, but the presumption was that patient was uh, at least at an intermediate risk category. Um, and again, mammography is um, appropriate for women during pregnancy. Possibly uh, ultrasound could be used as supplemental screening, and again, MRI is, is contraindicated. So very similar to the first couple variants, and we'll move on to question four. 45-year-old woman, 18 weeks pregnant, is due for annual screening. What do you recommend? Great. Uh, so we're starting to uh, get the hang of this. 74% uh, um, shows A, which is the correct answer. Um, and again, um, you know, mammography is safe and appropriate as the um, first-line imaging for these women um, during pregnancy. Um, you know, definitely um, for if anyone is calling in from other countries, there's definitely, uh, I've spoken to people in some other countries, there's definitely some concerns about, um, you know, mammography during pregnancy and even in the U.S., um, you know, historically there were concerns about radiation as we talked about, um, but the ACR does support um, mammography during pregnancy. So again, this is uh, usually appropriate and um, despite the uh, relative radiation level. All right, next question. 28-year-old woman, 30 weeks pregnant, with skin redness and painful palpable mass. What is the appropriate imaging, uh, initial imaging? Excellent. So uh, most of you chose targeted ultrasound, which is the correct answer. And so, uh, oh, sorry about that, guys. So um, this is for pregnant women with a palpable mass, um, and you know, breast ultrasound um, would be first line in these women with a palpable lump. It has the highest sensitivity, um, certainly more so than mammography, as we had seen, um, due to density concerns, and imaging should not be delayed um, in these women because um, this is the most common presentation of pregnancy-associated breast cancer. Um, and mammography certainly can be used as an adjunct. And again, there's no role for MRI as initial imaging um, as the patient is pregnant. So this is the recommendation from uh, the appropriateness criteria. And the take home point is that um, ultrasound is the first line imaging in uh, pregnant and lactating women with a palpable lump. And um, we should be biopsying solid palpable masses in pregnant women. All right, last question. 32-year-old woman, 28 weeks pregnant, presents with bloody nipple discharge. What is the appropriate initial test? Okay, so um, people were partly correct. Um, so basically the correct answer is both diagnostic mammogram and ultrasound. Um, either one could be the appropriate initial test. Um, isolated bloody nipple discharge um, without an associated palp um, it can be seen in less than 20% of pregnant women and usually is benign, as I mentioned, during certain periods of um, pregnancy. Um, but if it's persistent, um, it, it is suspicious, and 12% uh, of these can be due to cancer. So in contrast, 3% um, risk of malignancy in women under 40 with isolated pathologic nipple discharge, um, sort of in the general population. Um, and this is sometimes called um, rusty pipe syndrome when it is uh, physiologic in pregnant women. All right, and so this is variant six. Um, suspicious discharge during pregnancy, initial imaging, um, retroreal ultrasound, first line at any age, and then um, diagnostic mammography with retroreal mag views, um, either first line or as an adjunct to the ultrasound. So um, you can sort of pick your poison for uh, the first imaging test to be done, but um, either one is really appropriate. And again, MRI not appropriate during pregnancy. Okay, last one. 30-year-old woman, 34 weeks pregnant with recently diagnosed left breast cancer. What do you recommend for staging? So this one, um, most people chose DND, which is MAMO and complete ultrasound. Um, and the answer would be um, B and C. Um, so definitely, you know, one could make the argument to do complete ultrasound. Some practices may be doing that already. Um, Massachusetts, we're not really doing complete ultrasound um, for most women, um, but it's really important to um, stage accurately, um, local regional staging. 
And so again, mammography is safe. We should be looking for microcalcifications or other signs of malignancy. We want to do an ipsilateral axillary ultrasound really to look for lymphadenopathy, which may impact um, treatment planning. Um, and chemotherapy after the first trimester depends on the risk benefit to the patient. Um, and it's always important to discuss these patients in um, multidisciplinary tumor board. So um, MRI is recommended, uh, staging of the axilla is recommended um, in these patients, um, and that's sort of the more targeted ultrasound, um, but there's no evidence to support whole breast ultrasound for local regional staging in pregnancy. Um, and again, MRI, while not recommended during pregnancy, is recommended immediately following the pregnancy for staging um, because it can have a greater, um, it can demonstrate greater extent of disease compared to mammography and ultrasound. So again, um, mammography and ultrasound of the XLO. All right, so um, general management principles, and we're going to kind of try to zoom through some cases. Um, nearly all solid palpable masses in these women should warrant a biopsy, um, unless the characteristics are really um, pathognomonic for something benign. Um, risks, um, there's obviously risks of bleeding and infection with any biopsy, but there's also risk of a milk fistula um, as of the late third trimester um, in women who are lactating or beginning to lactate. Um, and then negative imaging of a palpable lump or thickening really, al as always, warrants clinical follow-up, but in these women it's, it's really important because um, there may be times where biopsy uh, is still warranted despite, uh, you know, negative imaging findings. Uh, we talked about um, the fact that isolated bloody nipple discharge can occur and be self-limited um, in pregnancy, um, but anything that persists should warrant um, diagnostic evaluation. So some cases. So these are a list of uh, many different benign pathologies, some of which occur predominantly in women who are lactating or pregnant, um, others that occur in any woman. Um, so first is a blocked milk duct. Um, Due to mechanical obstruction, um, management is typically a massage, um, warm compresses, and frequent milk expression. Um, it's seen as a, sort of a tubular, um, predominantly anechoic mass. It can have some uh, peripheral um, hypoechogenicity, which is related to inflammation, um, and that's a pretty typical finding. You can have benign lactational calcification. I apologize if these don't um, project very well. They're very fine. Uh, or sort of punctate calcifications in the breast that can be seen in women who are breastfeeding. Um, and they're secondary to gestational hyperplasia um, or secretory hyperplasia. Uh, galactoceles, they have the typical fat fluid level on the lateral magnification view, which you can see on the middle image. Um, they're the most common benign breast lesion during lactation um, related to an obstructed duct that um, dilates the proximal lobules. And um, we we can aspirate these um, for um, therapeutic relief and um, follow if asymptomatic. And these are some examples um, of galactoceles in other women. Um, they can be uh, cystic uh, with fat fluid levels. You can also see other uh, features um, and can be infected um, at times, which is a complication. Uh, they can rupture, galactoceles can rupture, and they typically will present with a tender lump, um, and it's important to um, biopsy um, to differentiate from cancer because they can look heterogeneous as these do um, on this image here. Lactational changes, um, you can have uneven um, proliferation of ducts and lobules. Um, you can get a heterogeneous hypoechoic mass uh, on ultrasound, and again, biopsy is performed to confirm benignity. Um, lactating adenoma, so this is an example of a 22-year-old with a right breast lump who was pregnant, um, typically seen in the third trimester and in the postpartum setting, similar features to fiber adenomas on ultrasound, um, and again, we biopsy to exclude malignancy, and these will regress on their own um, in the postpartum setting. So um, as you can see, they're generally sort of hypoechoic, circumscribed oval masses, sometimes some cystic components and very vascular. A uh, 38 year old with a palpable lump at 38 weeks. She declined a biopsy um, and post lactation, you can see that there's a spontaneous regression. Um, and then with the new pregnancy, it actually got a little bit bigger. 
So it's a presumed life fading adenoma. Purple mastitis, um, most commonly seen six weeks in the postpartum setting. Um, they're seeding through the nipple areolar complex from the infant nose and throat. Um, and there's a clinical diagnosis, um, but and you can have a fluctuant mass, and we suspect abscess. And the treatment is generally prompt antibiotics. Um, no imaging is necessary if it's uncomplicated, and ultrasound uh, only really if an abscess is suspected. Um, abscess is not really that different from um, other patients who have a breast abscess outside of uh, pregnant and lactating women. Um, and mammography is not necessarily required unless there's uh, malignancy suspected. So, you know, a reminder to perform a careful evaluation and follow up um, the necessary follow up for uh, proper diagnosis. So here are some examples of uh, mastitis on the left and abscess on the right. So you can you would be able to see potentially mobile fluid within this, um, and if no improvement, uh, recommend mammography to ensure that there's no pregnancy associated breast cancer. Fibroadenoma, the most common benign tumor um, during pregnancy and lactation. Um, it can be new or enlarging, um, painless, firm, mobile, rubbery mass, um, typical features on ultrasound, similar in the, uh, to the non-pregnant or non-lactating women, um, but sometimes there can be somewhat atypical features, um, and biopsy would be recommended um, for these patients. You can have reactive lymphadenopathy um, in the breast or the axilla, <clears throat> and biopsy depending on the clinical scenario. Hydradenitis, um, this is a 29-year-old with a palpable right axillary lump. Um, she had a uh, blocked epidermal sweat gland, which is what it is, um, and you can have um, complications um, with cellulitis, um, and these are treated also with warm compresses and antibiotics. Granulomatous, granulomatous mastitis is rare, <coughs> um, and seen in younger women within five years of pregnancy, hard mass, um, you know, similar features sometimes to um, cancer or other indeterminate imaging, um, and so we would typically recommend uh, a biopsy to uh, roll this out. Uh, this is just another case, and you can see that this hypocoke mass has some irregular margins and shadowing, and uh, we recommended biopsy for that, um, treated with antibiotics um, and steroids and possibly surgery. Uh, again, malignancy, we're going to just try to move very quickly towards the end here. Um, pregnancy associated breast cancer, uh, most common, and then um, lymphoma can be seen in some other uh, malignancies as well. Um, diagnosed during pregnancy or during the first uh, postpartum year uh, or lactation, the most common invasive cancer diagnosis during pregnancy, and 3% of all diagnosed breast cancer. It's usually, again, pain, palpable painless lump. Um, and again, uh, what we had said earlier, uh, poor prognosis because of uh, because it's larger at diagnosis, it's usually higher grade with lymph node involvement, um, and there's a high prevalence for uh, hormone receptor negative tumors and HER2 positive tumors. Um, similar features um, to non-pregnancy associated breast cancer, um, which hopefully you're familiar with, and we'll just go through some cases. So there's a 25-year-old woman, uh, 38 weeks pregnant. She has this mass on ultrasound with associated calcifications on mammography. This is a grade 3 IDC. Um, this is a CT scan. Um, she had surgery and then chemotherapy, and uh, imaging features are similar to non-pregnant uh, women. Uh, this is a 32-year-old, six weeks postpartum with a painful palpable mass, hypoechoic uh, on ultrasound, um, grade 2 IDC, treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. 48-year-old woman with left breast enlargement for two months following spontaneous abortion, um, and you can see the increased density. Um, biopsy confirmed lobular carcinoma and metastatic lymph node. Um, we can see thickening of the lymph node there. Uh, on MRI, you can see a shrunken breast with skin thickening and sort of diffuse non mass enhancement um, in these lobular patients, and this was treated by neoadjuvant followed by mastectomy. Uh, primary B cell lymphoma, 35 uh, year old woman, 28 weeks pregnant. Um, management uh, was delivery and then chemotherapy for her. She has Diffusely increased breast density and skin thickening, uh, a sort of vague hypoechoic heterogeneous area, um, areas of echogenicity. Um, so lymphoma, you know, not necessarily suspected up front um, unless there's a known history. So again, um, in the pregnant woman, screening is generally considered safe. Um, 
but sometimes not performed. Um, diagnostic imaging, ultrasound is first line, do a mammogram if cancer is suspected, um, MRI is contraindicated in these women, in lactating women, again, pump and dump, um, start with the uh, mammography if a uh, woman is greater than 30 years in the diagnostic setting, um, and MRI is important um, in lactating women as well. So, um, you know, the, take, the general take home message is biopsy, most solid masses, um, in the in setting of pregnancy and lactation due to risk of pregnancy associated breast cancer. Um, thank you so much for your attention and um, I'm sorry that I ran a couple minutes late. Feel free to reach out um, with any questions uh, and comments. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fishman, for that very interesting presentation. We covered a ton of material. Although we're a couple minutes over, I do think there's a question we should address live. Um, someone asked why you had talked about pumping and dumping after mammography. Sure. Um, not, uh, not after a mammogram, uh, it's before a mammogram. So um, the, the goal, uh, the suggestion of pump and dump is just that we are, um, the woman is pumping the milk, um, which will help um, express the milk from the ducts that are um, filled prior to the mammogram and thereby decreasing the density of the tissue on the mammogram and making it uh, more interpretable. Okay, so you just want women to empty their breasts prior to a mammogram, but they could do so by, you know, breastfeeding their child in the waiting room or pumping and saving that milk and, and giving that milk to their child later. There's no That's need correct. To There's no impact on the milk itself from having a mammogram performed. Okay, and ACR currently recommends that women can pump and dump after gadolinium ad administration with MRI, but they don't need to. You can continue the breastfeeding relationship uninterrupted. That's correct. Okay. Great, thank you again. That was a very interesting presentation. We will now um, continue with Dr. Monica Sheff's presentation. Um, she will be talking about the nuts and bolts of breast calcifications. Take it away, Dr. Sheff. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm gonna be covering everything about breast calcification, so let's get started. So our objective today is um, for you to be able to tell if calcifications are benign or something suspicious. So this isn't going to be an eye test. We're going to have some cases at the end. Um, I want you to be able to develop your skills of identifying calcifications on screening exams, but this talk is going to be uh, primarily based on helping you decide if you see a patient, if you see calcifications, um, whether you should be concerned or not. And I also want you to learn about um, how to characterize the calcifications appropriately using BioRads lexicon shape and distribution descriptors. So let's get started. So why are breast calcifications significant on mammography? Because sometimes calcifications are the only sign of breast cancer. So 30 to 50% of non-palpable breast cancers will manifest only as calcifications and 70% of minimal cancers. And minimal cancers are GCAS or invasive cancer that's less than one centimeter. So the keys to evaluating breast calcifications are assessing the shape and distribution. The number of calcifications is not important and you need to judge the calcifications by their worst features. And it's always important to compare mammogram with priors whenever available. Before we can understand the shape and distribution of calcifications, we need to understand the anatomy of the breast. Um, and once we understand that, we can understand why calcifications take partic particular shapes and distributions. So um, I guess the muscle of the breast is uh, the terminal duct lobular units and the ductules itself, which um, create breast milk. We also have the interlobular terminal duct lobular unit, the extra lobular unit, and then the main mammary duct. So all of these components can have calcifications. So the lobule again is the milk producing portion of the gland and you can see uh, low grade DCIS as granular calcifications, possibly LCIS, and then also benign um, etiologies such as milk of calcium, sclerosing adenosis, fibrocystic change, and fibroadenomas. Within the mammary duct, you're gonna see high grade DCIS, which is cal um, casting calcifications, and benign plasma cell mastitis, which we're gonna review. And within the breast tissue outside of the tubular structures, you can have dermal calcifications, dystrophic calcifications, and vascular calcifications, which are benign. 
So let's dive into the BIRADS classification. So BIRADS is going to divide calcifications into those that are typically benign and those that have a higher probability of malignancy. So let's start with the first group. So dermal calcifications. These are tiny calcifications. They're round, they have lucent centers, and you can identify them on tangential imaging. So this is on the tangent. You can see the calcifications are within the skin. Or if you have tomosynthesis, dermal calcifications will present on the last five to 10 slices. Dermal calcifications are specifically seen along the um, inframammary fold, along the medial peristernal space, and along the axilla. You can also see them around the nipple areola complex, especially in patients that have had uh, breast augmentation. Some dermal calcifications will appear atypical. So they could mimic the appearance of parenchymal calcifications. And one way to distinguish this is by the tattoo sign. So the calcifications are gonna have the same configuration on the CC and MLO views. Again, if you have tomosynthesis, you will see these calcifications on the last five to 10 slices. One way, um, if you do not have uh, tomosynthesis, you can do tangential imaging. So you get the alpha numeric grid that is used for breast localization. Um, the technologists will take an image. You'll see where the calcifications are located. Here they are located at D10. The technologists will place a BB at that location and then they will take a tangential image with a BB in profile and you will be able to see that the uh, calcifications are located within the skin and that these are benign. Vascular calcifications have a linear tram track configuration and you may see <coughs> tubular vessel, especially on tomosynthesis. They have a serpentine S-like configuration. You, in early vascular calcifications, you may only see calcifications along one side of the vessel, um, but again, look for the underlying tubular vessel and a serpiginous uh, configuration. We also have coarse popcorn-like calcifications that are seen with degenerating fibroadenomas. These can be multiple in 10 to 20% of the cases. There are large, dense, sharply marginated calcifications and fibroadenomas are also hormonally sensitive, so they can enlarge in pregnancy and they usually degenerate and involute after menopause. Large raw light calcifications, also known as secretory disease and plasma, plasma cell mastitis and ductectasia are also seen. These are an inflammatory process that causes calcifications to fill the ducts. And this can have two um, visual appearances. If the calcifications form within a dilated duct, they will have an interductal um, linear look. They can also form uh, periductal, so along the wall, and it will be lucent in the center. So this is just uh, an example of this, where you have dense, sharply marginated, smooth, sausage-like calcifications. So this is the periductal calcifications. And you can also have the thin, large, dense, rod-like calcifications, which are the introductal calcifications of plasma cell mastitis. Again, both of these, whether it's periductal or introductal, will be oriented along the breast ducts. This is just another diagram. You have the terminal duct globular unit and the main ducts. And you can see as the calcifications form along these structures, that is what gives you the visual appearance of these linear um, calcifications that are large and rod-like extending to the nipple, which is benign plasma cell mastitis. We can have rim calcifications. These were previously called eggshell calcifications in the prior Byrads lexicon. If they are small, these are dermal calcifications with lucent centers. You can also have large rim calcifications that are a sign of fat necrosis or oil cyst formation in patients that have had surgery or trauma. Another benign calcification within the breast tissue is milk of calcium. And this is calcifications that can form um, or sediment within dilated asini or lobules, or you may even form in microcyst and larger cyst. And the distinguishing feature is that on the lateral view, you're gonna see a curvilinear or layering appearance of the calcifications. So this is an example of this. Um, you can see there is a change in the density. Uh, this is actually underlying cyst on the CC view. It's like you're looking down into um, a coffee cup and you just see the, the coffee straight across. So it's smudgy, it's cloud-like, but if you have your coffee glass on a table and you're looking from the side and the coffee is the calcification in this case, you will see that it's layering and flat. So this is the curvilinear 
um, appearance of benign milk of calcium that you see. So again, milk of calcium is gonna change shape on the CC to the lateral views. Dystrophic calcifications are another type of benign calcifications. These are coarse sheet-like calcifications. Um, they may not have a lucent center, and you will see this um, in a surgical bed or area of prior trauma. We also have round and punctate calcifications that are tiny, so less than one millimeter for round and less than half a millimeter for punctate, and they are forming within the acinus, and they're sharply marginated and dense, and the distribution is going to depend on the etiology. So now let's dive into calcifications that have a higher probability of malignancy. And again, when we see these calcifications, we have to be able to describe and understand the shape and the distribution. So let's dive into that. So suspicious morphology, we have amorphous calcifications. These calcifications are small, they're hazy, it's really hard to tell what exact shape they have. And looking at their distribution is key. So they may be a low-grade cancer to even benign findings such as grossing adenosis and fibrocystic change. You can have coarse heterogeneous calcifications, which are irregular, they're more conspicuous, they vary in size, and they may merge into one another. You have fine pleomorphic calcifications. They're irregular, they're small, they're discrete. They can vary in size and shape, but there are no linear components. And then we have fine linear and fine linear branching calcifications. So again, small calcifications, they can be irregular, they can be linear, they can have a dot dash appearance or that of broken needles or broken glass. So this is sort of a summation slide with all the different types of uh, morphologies or shapes of calcification. So amorphous, it's really hard to tell the exact shape. Coarse heterogeneous, they're more discrete, there are different sizes. Fine pleomorphic are small, but different sizes. You have the fine linear and the fine linear branching. So they're linear and they also may be branching. So now let's talk about the distribution. You can have calcifications that are randomly distributed throughout the breast. Those are considered diffuse. They can be regional, which means they're not conforming to a duct. It can be greater than one quadrant, uh, greater than two centimeters. You can have a group of calcifications. So the word group has replaced clustered calcifications in the pri prior Byred's lexicon. We should be using the word grouped. So that's five or more calcifications within one centimeter of tissue. And then you have linear, so going along a duct and a line, and segmental, which is less than a quarter of the breast tissue, but it's going sort of along the growth, uh, the, the duct lines towards the nipple. So we're gonna get more suspicious when we have um, the linear and segmental calcifications. Um, you're not con as concerned when you see diffuse calcifications, especially if they're bilateral, it lets you think of a systemic process that's going on. So now to the fun part of the talk. Um, you're gonna see a series of cases and I wanna know whether or not you think we should biopsy the calcifications, you would give them a BIRADS four or five, or we shouldn't biopsy the calcifications and you would give it a BIRADS two. So let's get started with the first case, to biopsy or not. Okay, fantastic. So majority said not to biopsy these calcifications. Um, so let's see why. Okay, so these are the coarse um, heterogeneous calcifications, the popcorn calcifications that we see with degenerating fibroadenomas. There are um, a suggestion that this patient has multiple of them. So you see some other uh, coarse uh, benign type calcifications. So this is benign, it's a BIRADS2. Next case, biopsy yes or no? Great, again, majority said no, that is correct. So. Here we have a case that we see a dystrophic sheet-like calcification. You can see that there's this linear dermal scar marker that the technologist has placed in the area of patient's dermal scarring. So this is just within a post-surgical bed. Um, these calcifications are benign. Next case, biopsy, yes or no? Okay, great. So majority, 72% said yes. So let's go over this case because this is a tricky case. So there are two types of calcifications you can see here. There's some coarse heterogeneous calcifications, but if you look more closely, you see some faint fine linear calcifications. So again, they're fine linear in shape, they're linear in distribution. Those are concerning features and we should biopsy the calcifications because of that. So yes, biopsy the calcifications. 
um, they're fine. Linear calcifications, BIRADS4, the pathology was DCIS. So next case, great. So a majority, 98% said no, so that is correct. So let's look to see what we have here. So this is a saline implant. You can tell that it's saline because you can see through the fluid. Um, it is located in the retroglandular space. You do not see the pectoralis muscle in front of it. So these um, calcifications are also, are actually calcifications that have formed on the polyurethane coated um, outer envelope of the implant. So these are benign. We do not need to biopsy these. Next case. Fantastic, 90% said no, so that is correct. So here we have uh, coarse dystrophic calcifications, and this is in a patient that had implants that were removed. So these are calcifications that we're seeing along the fibrous capsule that develops around breast implants. And you usually see capsular calcifications um, more in subglandular implants than subpectoral implants, and they do not imply rupture if you still see them when the implant is present. It's just a benign process. Um, there's no management of this. This is a BIRADS2. Next case, biopsy, yes or no? Fantastic, so 70% say biopsy. So let's take a closer look at this case. So we have calcifications that are small and various um, in size, so fine pleomorphic. And on the two views, if we look at the prior mammogram, you can see that it is going in um, a segmental distribution towards the nipple. And you can even see some calcifications extending into the nipple. So this is very concerning and suspicious. We'd recommend biopsy. Again, they're fine pleomorphic and a segmental distribution, uh, both of which are suspicious. And this was ductal carcinoma in situ. Next case, biopsy, yes or no? Okay, so 75% say yes, 25% um, no. So let's look into this case because this case also has some different types of calcification. So when we look more closely, looks like there's some casting calcifications, right? We discussed casting calcifications. You can see that with secretory, which is benign or uh, DCIS. But if you look more closely posteriorly, we have some granular calcifications, some um, linear, maybe some branching. Um, it's going towards the, the nipple. So this is, you know, we're very concerned when we see this, the fine linear branching and again, going towards the nipple. Um, so this, there's a combination of calcifications here and this ended up being um, DCIS. Um, the, the story behind this case is I actually biopsied calcifications in the back and they came back benign um, as fat necrosis. And I said that was discombobulated discordant and we biopsied um, another area of more visible calcifications and that came back as DCIS and pathology went back and reviewed the first site and um, it was originally DCIS. So it's important to uh, keep in mind the shape of the calcifications, the distribution and your suspicion level. Even when you get biopsy results back, you have to figure out the next step to give the patient the appropriate management. So this is um, an illustration going over DCIS because DCIS can have variable experiences, um, appearances. You can have casting calcifications that are fine linear, maybe fine linear branching that is along um, the ducts. And you see that again with the high grade comedonecrosis. You can also have a granular appearance of DCIS. They can appear amorphous or fine pleomorphic. Again, still going along. Uh, the distribution of the ducts, but this is more often seen with low-grade non comedo necrosis. Next case, biopsy or not? Grade 85% say no. So this is a great case to go along with the case that we just saw. So here we see um, interductal calcification. They're smooth. There is some branching. They're going towards the nipple. We see this with secretory calcifications. This is benign abirads too. So how do we differentiate this from the prior case? Again, these are large calcifications. They're smooth. There's not much branching. There are no small granular calcifications um, that would make us concerned about another process that's going on. And again, it's not branching as frequently as you would see with DCIS. Next case, 
Fantastic. So 99% said no. So this case, um, this is just a close up, is a nice case of something that we don't see as often anymore. But this is, uh, is silicon granulomas, and that is when somebody has an augmentation of the breast. Uh, it's not surgical, but it's through injections where silicon oil or gels or bioactive agents can be injected into the breast tissue. And this causes a foreign body giant cell reaction and fat necrosis in the breast. So you will see the typical benign rim calcifications and central lucency uh, with this. This is Virads 2. It just makes reading this person's mammogram, ultrasound, and MRI uh, challenging, but it is a Virads 2. So next case, biopsy, yes or no? Great, so 62% say no, and 38% say yes. So this was a tricky case. Um, so there are actually two types of calcifications in this picture. You see these large tract calcifications, which are vascular calcifications and benign, but you also see this group of calcifications um, that are fine, pleomorphic, different shapes. Uh, it's in a group, so more than five calcifications and less than one centimeter. Um, which we would want to get a tissue sample of. These came back as a benign fibrocystic change, but it was given a BIRADS 4 because it was a change from the prior exam. Next case, biopsy, yes or no? Okay, this is another tricky question. Um, this is something we would not want to biopsy, but I understand that this does not um, conform to any of the patterns that we have discussed. So this is actually hair artifact and it will show up as something that's strand-like or curvilinear, it should be near the chest wall or pectoralis muscle, and you would just have the technologist repeat the image after moving um, the hair away, and that solves the issue. So again, this is not conforming to any ductal distribution um, or to any of the typically benign calcifications that we described. So this is a benign artifact. Next case, biopsy, yes or no? Biopsy, yes, 93%, great job. So let's look to see what we have here. So we have coarse heterogeneous, so large calcifications of different shapes. They're in a segmental distribution going towards the nipple. And on the mammogram, it looks like there may even be um, associated density with this. Um, so again, coarse heterogeneous segmental, you might see an associated focal asymmetry. In cases where you see calcifications that may have a mass associated with it or um, the tissue looks changed, you can always get an ultrasound to see what you see. In this case, we have an irregular mass. You can see the echogenic calcifications. Um, this was biopsied yielding invasive ductal cancer. So if you can see associated mass with the calcifications, you get concerned that there is an invasive component as well. Next case, biopsy, yes or no? Great, so 95% say no, so that is correct. So um, these are sutural calcifications. This linear line is the dermal skin marker, scar marker that the technologist has placed on the patient. And then we see sort of knots and um, linear areas that have calcified. So sutural calcifications are calcium deposits in the suture material. They can be linear, it can be tubular, you can may see the knots, and it should be adjacent to post-surgical change. And they usually uh, show up two years post-surgery and radiation. So these are benign, BIRADS too. We have a few more cases. Biopsy, yes or no? So 56% say no and 44 yes. So this is a tricky case as well. So this is just a zoomed up image, but let's look at this. So we have amorphous calcification, so those are concerning, but the distribution is diffuse. So it was bilateral in both breasts, um, taking up most of the breast. And I know I said you should go with the most suspicious morphology, so it is amorphous, um, but this is a case where you'd want more history on a patient. So um, this case, I went to talk to the patient and they had a connective tissue disorder, or low stainless, um, Again, there's amorphous calcifications, but they were diffuse and it was bilateral. Um, it went along with the patient's um, history with connective tissue disorder. This is a BIRADS 2. Next case, great, 86% say no. So this again is another tricky question. Um, so these are calcifications, it looks like calcifications within lymph nodes, but we have to figure out why they're there. So this is when history and talking to the patient is very important. We could see calcifications because of gold therapy, or rheumatoid, um, tattoo inks. In this case, this patient had um, tattoos all the way down her left arm and uh, green and blue inks are known 
to, to show pigments in the, the lymph nodes more often. The patient could have granulomatous disease or silicon implant rupture, uh, treated uh, granulomatous infection or metastatic thyroid or ovarian cancer and metastatic breast cancer. So you just need to get a little bit more history and talk to the patient and then decide what to do. Next case, biopsy, yes or no? Great, so great job, 82% say no. So that is correct, this is benign coarse fat necrosis. You can see the lucent center, it's in a surgical bed. We do not wanna biopsy this. Next case, biopsy, yes or no? So 87% said yes. So let's take a closer look at this. So we have two, two sets of calcifications here. On the CC view, um, they can look amorphous, but on the lateral, they are layering. And I have a dotted outline, this was a cyst, so they're layering at the bottom of the cyst. Then we have the second group, it's a very loose group um, of scattered calcs here, but on the lateral, you can see it's teacups are layering. So this is actually benign milk of calcium, and um, this is a BIRADS too. So just calcifications within the SNI. Next case, biopsy, yes or no? So 94% said yes, so that is correct. So we have fine linear branching calcifications. There's some uh, fine pleomorphic. Uh, again, segmental distribution. Whenever we see the linear uh, branching, segmental, um, we get very concerned. This was DCIS. Next case, biopsy, yes or no? So biopsy, 55% said yes, and 45% uh, said no. So let's dive into this, because this is another tricky um, case. These do look like coarse heterogeneous calcifications, but let's also look at the location. This is located within the axilla. So we want to make sure that this isn't deodorant artifact. So one way would be, if, there's, if it's on tomosynthesis, we need to look at the last five to 10 slices. If it's in the skin, we know it's deodorant artifact. We don't need to be concerned. Um, if we don't have that ability, we'd have the patient, we'd recall the patient to come back and we'd have the technologist wipe the underarm area to make sure it's clean and repeat the image. So here we see that the artifact is gone. So this is deodorant artifact. You should always keep this in mind uh, if you see um, something that mimics calcium within the underarm. So we see this uh, with deodorants, powders, ointments, lotions, anything that has zinc, aluminum, or magnesium, which can simulate calcifications on mammography. Again, clean the axilla and repeat the view. If you have tomosynthesis, it should be on the last five to 10 slices. So now let's dive into a review. So calcifications, when you see them, you have to think in your mind, are these benign or are these suspicious? If they're typically benign, they should fit into uh, one of these categories. Um, skin calcifications, round with lucent centers. You can see them on tangential imaging or on the last five to 10 slices on TOMO. Rim calcifications, um, again, lucent center calcifications along the border. This is benign fat necrosis or in areas of surgery. Secretory calcifications, large rod-like calcifications extending towards the nipple. It can be bilateral. You see a few branches, but no granular calcifications and not lots of branching. We have vascular calcifications, which have a tram track appearance. You may see an underlying vessel, especially on tomosynthesis. We have coarse popcorn calcifications that are seen with degenerating fibroadenomas. We have milk of calcium that changes shape on the CC and lateral views. On the lateral, you should see the uh, typical layering or curvilinear appearance um, described as teacup appearance of the calcifications that are sedimenting. Dystrophic sheet-like calcifications are benign. Round punctate calcifications are generally benign. Um, you do have to look at the distribution and sutural calcifications. Again, when you have to look at morphology if you're thinking something may be suspicious. So amorphous, they're small, hazy, it's hard to tell the shape. Coarse heterogeneous, they're regular but conspicuous. Fine pleomorphic, small, uh, they're small and irregular. Fine linear and fine linear branching. And then again, also look at the distribution. If it's diffuse throughout the breast and bilateral, it's benign. If it's regional, it doesn't conform to a duct. It's greater than two centimeters. If it's grouped, you see five or more calcifications in less than one centimeter. And if you see them in a line or a branch along the duct, it's linear or segmental going towards the nipple, less than one quadrant. You're gonna be very concerned when you see the linear and segmental calcifications. So the conclusion, again, when you see calcifications, think in your mind, do these fit with the benign calcifications? Do they fit the artifacts that I know about? Or is it something suspicious? 
If it's suspicious, look at the shape and the distribution and judge it by its uh, most suspicious feature. And if you have new calcifications that are increasing or linear or segmental, please biopsy them. So thank you for your time. I hope you have a, a better understanding of breast calcifications um, because they can be challenging uh, many times. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sheth, for your really wonderful presentation. I think the audience participation aspect of both of the talks today was really, really well done. So thank you again to both Dr. Fishman and Dr. Sheth for taking the time to give these incredible talks. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, this session will be posted to the APDR YouTube channel within about a week. Thank you to all of our participants for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you at the next APDR virtual noon conference this Thursday, July 2nd. We will be talking about cardiothoracic imaging in pregnancy and adult congenital heart disease. Thanks, everybody. Be well.